Sadam Yogi Sanyoginis. Let us talk today about the word guru. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the origin of this word and uh, how is that related to the three caves. What is that? We will find out. We will go into that in a, in a moment. Uh, we saw in, a little, in another video about light. We were talking about light and the different parts of ourselves who were shining. And today we're going to talk about the, the polarity of light and darkness. And we find that in the actual word of Guru. We will, we will explore this through the meaning of the word. Traditionally, it was just used to, to mean a teacher, which could be like an enlightened, liberated teacher, but it could also be just like a, like a regular teacher who was somebody who was teaching you something. There is a, there is a reason for that, that we would use that very same word. Uh, now we tend to say, well, there are many teachers, but gurus is, you know, they were, these were the gurus, you know, Guru Nanak, uh, uh, Guru Gobind Singh, uh, these, these were the ones who were reaching a certain level, a certain state, a certain moment, um, a certain state of enlightenment and, or liberation. And uh, let's say that now we are teachers. Yeah, we are not gurus now. We, we, we say it like this, especially in our tradition, tradition of uh, Kundalini Yoga. But um, it may happen that in other traditions, you may feel other people who, are, who call themselves gurus. And that's perfectly fine. It's just the way we use the word. So what does the word mean? Well, it is often mentioned how guru is related to gu, is related to darkness and do related to light. Let's go into this a little bit in detail. Now, gu, the sound gu is very guttural. Yeah, it's, it's in the throat. It's made in the throat. And it's uh, with the back of the mouth, yeah, to, towards the throat. It's like a swallowed sound almost. It's a sound that uh, we, in the English language, which we know the English language and Sanskrit and Gurmukhi, they have a very common root. Yeah, it's called a Indo-European language. Indo, because it comes from India. So in the, in the original a uh, root behind, uh, before Sanskrit and before Gurumukhi is the same root as before uh, English, though it was then mixed up with other things, yeah, along the way. But this Proto-Indo-European is called P-I-E. If you look into etymology, uh, you will find this P-I-E very often. In the P-I-E, in the P-I-E root of uh, Proto-Indo-European, uh, root of the word guru, they, they say it's guere. It comes from guere, which means heavy, yeah? Uh, which means somebody who has a weight, yeah? Somebody whose words are heavy on you. They, they have a weight on you. They have importance. They, they have a, a certain, a lot of value, yeah? They have weight. Uh, there is another way of taking the word apart, which is gu and ru, and the gu itself uh, you can find gu in, in English words such as grotto, yeah? Or in, uh, I'm Spanish, so I find in Spanish the word uh, agujero, yeah? Agujero means hole in English. Or you can find it in gruta, which is like grotto, yeah? Uh, so a, a, a hole or a cave or a grotto, yeah? Because gruta means uh, cave as well, yeah? Grotto is like a cave, so... A cave is a dark place, yeah? Generally, a cave is, is where, you know, you go into the mountain and then there is an entrance and then you go in and there is darkness inside. And it can be cooling, it can be refreshing, it can also be like a refuge. Uh, if we think about in the old times when we lived out of, you know, the most basic uh, survival, uh, trying to defend ourselves from predators and so on, a cave would be a great refuge. So a cave was somewhere safe where we could rest yeah, and protect ourselves. So there is a lot of um, meaning to, psychological meaning to the word cave, but generally we associate it with darkness, which is not necessarily something negative, yeah? Because we, that's another thing we need to talk about, how we separate the darkness and light as a polarity. And often when we look at polarities, we make dualities out of them. We make, we make the two aspects, like one is good and what is wrong, which is a duality, yeah? But there's nothing right and nothing wrong. I mean, there's, 
qualities to light and there's qualities to darkness. And if we just avoid the darkness or ignore the darkness or try to escape from the darkness, we are repressing things. And we see this very often when when uh, people repress their shadow, yeah, their shadow side, and then it manifests in weird and um, unhealthy karmic ways. And we don't want that. So, and there is a lot of power in the shadow as well. So we need to relate to the shadow in a healthy way. However, let's go back. Gu then is darkness as a cave. And in uh, in Sanskrit, you would, or Gurumukhi, uh, uh, you will find it pronounced a slightly different sometimes, but it's like guha or gufa. So you may explore it like guha or gufa. And this is cave. And uh, the word ru, yeah, ru is like ra. In Sanskrit and Gurumukhi, the vowels um, don't change so much the meaning of the word. Sometimes it's like because of the position of the word in the sentence, it, the, the the ending vowel will change, just on many, as many other languages, yeah? So, um, like for example, ad gure namhe, yeah, namhe, namhe, and uh, ong namo, yeah, namo, is the same, and sat nam is nam, nam, namo, namhe, is the same, is identity. But it, depending on how you use that word, and I guess whether it's the object or the or the subject of the of the sentence and things like that. I, I'm not proficient on this. So I'm not really a an scholar, but I understand that it, it will have different endings. However, the root of the word is the same. So, uh, ru, yeah, guru, ru, and ra, they are very connected, yeah, and it's the, this r sound, r, r. It's very much like an engine, yeah, Rrr, vibrating, yeah, and uh, there's fire in it. And uh, we were talking about light the other day in another video, so um, uh, Ra, Ra is very connected to light. It's actually the Bija Mantra for the third chakra. We may explore this. Um, you may look at the different sounds that activate every chakra. We may explore this in another video, but um, every... Chakra has a particular sound which activates it um, and, you know, plants the seed of that chakra. This is Bija. Yeah, Bija is a seed. So Bija mantra, Bija sound for the third chakra, that's Ram. Yeah. And the third chakra, we know it's associated with fire because earth, water, fire. Yeah. So uh, fire produces light. So there is light in that fire. Ru, Ra. And um, so the sound ra, this, this fiery vibration, is like bringing light out. There's also another very interesting thing about ra. If we look at the roots of the, of the, of the cultures from India, from Europe, we see it, there's a lot, there's a very strong influence from Egypt. And there's actually uh, some images of Egyptian um, uh, paintings or Egyptian sculptures and with postures that seem like yoga and um, very interesting topic but that's about yogic history and other things but let's let's go to Egypt in Egypt there was this Amon Ra yeah like the the sun god yeah one of the sun king yeah and they would associate it with like a god like a divine divine uh, person on earth to guide to rule the the, the people of Egypt, yeah? Uh, so Amun-Ra was associated with this sun god, yeah? Sun. So Ra was associated with sun, which means uh, light. It's very interesting. I found also in another researcher, um, uh, I don't remember what the name, uh, talking about how from the word Amon, you know, Amun-Ra, from Amon comes the word On, yeah? Or the, the two letters, yeah? On, which we use in uh, in English language to switch on things. Like I'm switching on my computer, and I'm switching it on, which is a way of saying I'm on Ra, bring light to my computer. Yeah, <laughs> it's like start my computer as if we were calling I'm on Ra every time we switch on the mobile phone. I'm on Ra, put it on. Yeah, <laughs> so I find it very funny that uh, there is this root in the word on in English to. It goes back to this Amon Ra that would be 
venerated for every time we have light. Yeah. Very interesting. So Amon linked to light and because it's Ra also to the sun and Ra as Uru uh, becomes light also in, uh, in the Sanskrit uh, word that we have for Guru. So Guru, Gu, darkness, and Aru is, is light. Now, uh, generally, when we have the two words together, Guru, there's a few ways to translate this. You can say Guru is the one who brings darkness to the light. Yeah. And what is that? What is that? Uh, sorry, <laughs> brings light to the darkness, not darkness to the light, brings light to the darkness. So bringing light to the darkness is like um, getting us out of our ignorance. Yeah. Light is like the age of enlightenment, yeah? Light is like wisdom, yeah? It's like, oh, now I see, now I understand, now I perceive. It goes beyond that. It's not just an understanding, yeah? It's much farther than that. But there is also this aspect of, wow, okay, now I, now I get it, now I see it, yeah? So, um, Guru is like, out of our darkness, our ignorance, now there is a point of light yeah and the thing with the light is doesn't matter how dark the cave is if you 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 start you know you you um uh, struck a match yeah the smallest amount of light of that match will illuminate the area so there is already light yeah no matter how little it is it's already illuminating the area so this guru yeah guru is that which brings a light to our darkness. Another way to translate it would be, another way to interpret that word would be to find the light in the darkness. Not so much to bring light to the darkness, but to actually find light in the darkness. That's a, a very nice translation of the word as well. So Guru is that which brings light to our darkness or finds light in our darkness. And that's why it is used for teachers. Yeah, A teacher is somebody who is bringing you channeling, yeah, transmitting, delivering these teachings. And those teachings bring light to you. Yeah, you're like, wow, now I see. So in that way, in the, utilizing that way, it's understandable why we would use that word for just regular human teachers. Yeah, Though we, would, we tend to, in Kundalini Yoga tradition, we will tend to associate it more to the gurus. Yeah, the people who were here, who were beyond human. Yeah, yeah they were already in a certain level. Yeah. Okay, so guru. There's another thing about the word guru. Uh, if you look at the original, how it's written in Sanskrit or Guru Mukhi, the first u is smaller than the second one. Yeah, the second u is longer. So it's guru. It's not guru. Yeah, it's guru. That's relevant because the first u is half of the time of the second. Why? Because the emphasis on the, is on the light. The emphasis is not on the darkness. If we say guru, guru, yeah, we are emphasizing darkness. If we say guru, guru, we are emphasizing light. So if you wish, we can try. We can do a little experiment. And let's see how it feels, yeah? So you can close your eyes and try. Guru, guru. Guru, 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 Guru. Okay. For some reason, I was I was chanting like this, and I was uh, hearing the sound of this uh, this this movie about the shark. Turning, 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 turning. <laughs> Something dark is coming. So, <laughs> like the shark is coming uh, for us, right? It's almost like danger. Yeah. Guru, it's darkness. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> jokes aside, let's uh, let's explore the the other way of chanting it. Eh? Close the close the eyes. Guru, 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 guru. Okay, let's let's explore it with a mantra. Yeah, the guru, guru, ahi, guru, guru, randas, guru. Let's try it again, just with that mantra. Guru, Guru, Wahe, Guru, Guru, Ram, Das, Guru, 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 
Wahe Guru Guru Ram Das Guru. Let's try the second way, the second version. Guru Guru Wahe Guru Guru Ram Das Guru. Guru Guru Wahe Guru Guru Ram Das Guru. How did it feel for you? Feel free to write in the comments. How did it feel, the difference between Guru and Guru? It's important that we share. Yeah, that we, there is something universal about the vibration, about sound. And the way we chant it, there is a universal way that it's going to affect all of us. But then there is a personal effect on us as well. So, in personally, the way I feel it, Guru, 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 is there is like a tension, there is a sense of... Um, uh, Retraction going inwards and like not particularly relaxed and open. Yeah, guru, guru is much softer, more like an offering, like offering the words guru, guru. But I'm I'm curious to hear how you how you experience it. I wanted to say also that I'm not a purist. I I I don't believe in just being too strict in the way of chanting something. There is something about you know, artistic liberties. Yeah. And when we are making music, we may explore different ways of chanting it. And maybe, you know, maybe we want to explore the darkness when we are chanting. There's nothing wrong with that if we do it by the hand of Guru. So why not? Uh, let's just be aware of the way we utilize the word. Let's make it very conscious. Let's not make it unconscious, but let's use it consciously. And yeah, explore it if you wish. Uh, but don't also don't feel like, okay, if, you know, I hear this singer who has this music, but it's like guru, guru, you know, giving the emphasis on the guru, then I, I don't like it. Well, okay. I mean, I think there is a certain artistic freedom, yeah, in, in artistic liberty to explore the sound, to explore the music, because at the end of the day, the importance will be more on the quality of your heart when you are chanting the words rather than the actual technique that you use or whether you are strict about the pronunciation. I'm not a Sanskrit scholar or Gurmukhi scholar, so uh, even though I talk about mantras and I, I, my passion is mantra yoga as well, but I'm not perfect in my pronunciation, but I don't really care too much about being perfect. I appreciate pronunciation and I pay attention and I try to make it as correct as I can, but I don't try to be perfect about that. So. Um, Let's also have that aspect in mind. Yeah? All right, so Guru, Guru, this is from the shadow to the, to the light, yeah? from, the, from the darkness to the light or finding light in the darkness. Now, I said that we were going to talk about the caves, yeah? because Guru means cave, Gu, Guha or Guha means cave. Now, this is the most interesting part of the conversation, I believe. There is three caves in us. And we don't often talk about these caves. And I believe they are really important because they have a lot to do about the awakening of our Kundalini, or you can say the awakening of our consciousness, if you wish. So there is, there is three caves that are very relevant in our body. And I'm going to try to draw it a little bit, and um, we will explore them a bit more. Let us draw a little yogi. All right. So there is three caves, and um, remember, cave is guha or gufa, and we find that the first cave that is talked about in the teachings, it's called bish gufa, and this is like a cave, like the cave where, like the womb in the mother, yeah where the baby is uh, being developed and matu is maturing. This is um, 
there is an inner cave in that in the region. It's where is it? Is it's more like more like more or less sorry between the first and the third chakra. Yeah, in that area because it it can expand. Yeah, when a woman gets pregnant and then the baby is growing, this uh, area expands. So it's the entrance to the cave is in the first chakra, but it can it can be second chakra. It can be expanding. Yeah. Now in this in this cave there is a there is a symbol that it's often utilized a phallus yeah when you when you uh, go into um, when you go into a temple in india sometimes uh, if it's a shivaist temple yeah you will find they have a phallus the sim- yeah in the in a in an altar and they are like adoring it yeah now why is that because uh, the phallus is the symbol of shiva and um, it's like a stone yeah stone pillar and it's uh, like um, a symbol for a certain power yeah inside it's around this phallus that we said that the kundalini is asleep it is coiled like three and a half times around this symbol yeah so I, I'm just drawing it here in the cave. But this is called Bija. Bija Gufa. Yeah? Or Guha. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't matter too much. I'm gonna say Guha. Yeah. So Bija means seed, like a seed. I was uh, mentioning before about the Bija sound, the seed sounds for the chakras, and I mentioned how Ram, Ra is for the third chakra. So Bija means seed. So this is the, the cave of the seed. Yeah, It's where the man puts the seed into the woman for a baby to be able to be born. Now, we were talking in another video about light and giving light. It's very interesting in Spanish, giving birth to a baby, it's called giving light to a baby. So there is a certain light, there is a light of life that can grow in this cave. So it's a very powerful space yeah and um, and we can all tune into that power and that inner potential men and women yeah everybody can do that um, in a way that we can relate all of us to our own shakti our own power kundalini shakti it's called kundalini shakti kundalini kundalini uh, uh, it's co- coiled this little snake energy is coiled around this symbol uh, symbolically, is well, it's written like that. I just know that this is in our body, but uh, symbolically, the the snake is coiled there, and it's our own potential, our own human potential that we can all awake. And as it awakes, it can go up through the channels, and this is very much related to the um, the path of the Kundalini. is very much related to the three caves, and it's very connected to the knots that the cave has to undo to cross through. The knots are called grantis, but we will talk about this in another video because it's a, it's a deep subject. So this is Vijagufa, the Oguha, the, the cave of the seed. Then there is another cave that it is often uh, mentioned, and that is Gyanguha. This is the mouth, yeah? And I'm gonna draw it like that. It's the inversion of this symbol, yeah? And I'm going to say this is Gyan. Now, this is because, like, if you open the mouth, there is a little thing that hangs from above. I don't know the name in English now, I should know. Uh, in Spanish, it's like a, like a bell. It's called like a bell, yeah? Uh. That thing. So this is what I'm drawing here, yeah? And this is called the Gyan wisdom, yeah, the cave of wisdom. Now, why is it called like that? Because it depends of how you use that cave, you show your wisdom, yeah, how you talk, how you, the words that come out through your mouth, they're going to be very important to, because they have a great impact. We know the importance of the words. So you can see the wisdom there. But there is another reason, because as we are chanting, we are increasing our wisdom, yeah, the the practice of mantra chanting it's a whole science a whole technology in which the 
tongue, the tip of the tongue and the sides of the tongue are touching different points in the upper palate and they are stimulating different areas of the brain and is stimulating different channels of energy within our body and producing certain effects. And that can, um, chanting the right words will create wisdom in us. It will develop wisdom in us. Uh, the wisdom will come, yeah, let's say it like that. So that's another science that's a, a huge topic we need to explore slowly. It, it would take um, many videos, yeah? And we may do it slowly, <laughs> but uh, uh, let's just say it like that. Gyan wisdom, the cave of wisdom, is by the mouth, by the tongue moving in the cave, repeating the mantras, the Shabbat, doing kirtan, doing all these um, uh, chanting, expressive meditations, we find wisdom. Yeah, so Gyan, Gyan Guha. Now there is a third cave, and this, this would be a um, very interesting link to light as well, because as you are speaking, is you are bringing light yeah, to the others. So there is the Bish Guha in, the, in the, the womb, yeah, bringing light, life to the world, and then uh, also the light of your Kundalini that can awaken through inside of you. Gyanguha is your own wisdom, finding through your words. And then there is the third cave that is not very often talked about. And this is uh, Heridei or Hridaya Guha. I'm going to write it like this. But, you know, the Sanskrit word when we write it in, in this uh, with our own um, occidental uh, um, alphabets, sometimes it's written one way, sometimes it's written in another way. So you may find these words written in, in different ways, but it's not too important. Let's just say, Hiridai is said or Hridaya. Yeah, Hridaya. Hridai. I sing Hridaya because it's part of a mantra that I love. I'm going to chant this mantra in a moment. We, will, we can chant it all together. But uh, this is the cave of the heart. Hiridei means the heart. So maybe, you know, if, uh, if you are a, a Sanskrit scholar or your mother tongue is this language or, or you just know how to pronounce it better, write it in the chat and uh, make me know, help me as well to improve my, my own pronunciation. If anybody knows the difference between a guha, gufa, is it because one is uh, Indian and the other one is Persian, or is it just like the way to pronounce it in the south and in the north of India? These kind of things are, I don't know, and I'm interested. If you know about it, please let me know. Let us know, write in the comments so everybody can see. So the third cave was Hridaya, yeah, Hridaya. And this one, the heart, the cave of the heart, that's a different light, isn't it? It's the light of the heart that is illumin illumining everything around us, yeah? We didn't talk about this light when we were talking about the different lights in the body in the other video that uh, I was mentioning before, but there is a certain... We were talking about the presence in the arc line, but there is a certain, like, heart light we can say like a like a consciousness that comes through the heart that you can feel that it's enlightening the atmosphere around you and i believe that comes from after the whole journey of the kundalini and as the energy comes down and settles into the heart then it can shine from the heart so let's call it like that shining from the heart so that's a, a different form of light that the ones I talked about in the other video, because it has a different quality. And it has to do with the concept of illumination or liberation. Um, that's another difference that is very relevant. But let's not go into that, because we are opening avenues and we could like go in so many different ways. Let's stay with these uh, three caves. And um, so as, the, as, the, 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 as, we are our, as we are chanting, yeah, in our Gyanguha, we are awakening the Kundalini in Bishgufa, and the Kundalini needs to reach the crown to touch uh, enlightenment, and then it has to settle down into our heart, and then it's in our heart shining forth. Let's just put it like that. Short and sweet uh, explanation linking the three caves. Satnam, this is... Uh, Future Ardas, uh, editing Ardas, coming here to make a little comment 
on the purity of the teachings. I wanted to mention one thing before I go in, in depth talking about Ramana Maharshi, because I have a very special devotion to Ramana Maharshi. You can see him in the pictures, but I am in no way trying to um, convince anyone of the importance of his teachings and trying to tell everybody to we should all chant his mantras, we should bring his mantras into our classes and uh, into the Kundalini yoga class. Not at all. Uh, my, this is my personal devotion. This is my personal feeling. It's in a way I'm trying to, to show also that you don't have to uh, be only aligned to the Sikh Dharma and be only Guru Ramdas and have, you know, this particular devotion to the, the Sikh Gurus who are within our lineage, in our golden line. Uh, uh, but you can also have freedom to express your devotion in different ways. I love the teachings of Guru Nana, Guru Ramdas, the Gurus. I love the stories and I... Mm, I communicate them in the trainings and I'm sure I will bring them in these videos. Um, however, my heart is, is with Ramana Maharshi. So uh, I, I, by this video, I was considering even whether I should go into this or not, but I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to cut it, the, the segment which comes in a moment, because it's um, aligned with my heart. But uh, again, just to say, we should hold the purity of the teachings. My idea to in these videos uh, that I post here in YouTube is not about bringing other teachings from other lines and mix them up and let's put them all together in a Kundalini Yoga class. Not at all. My idea is that Kundalini Yoga is very ancient. There is roots in many places. I like to read classical texts and see what is in common and what is different. And not only classical texts, but teachers from other traditions. I don't think Ramana Maharshi is connected to the lineage from Yogi Bhajan. Just, just like sometimes I may have talked about uh, flamenco singers, or I may talk about Taoist uh, practices or Kung Fu teachings or whatever. I like to uh, appreciate the, that we are all a universal, there's universal energy in all of us. We are all one. It's Ekonkar and practices all throughout the world in many different tra traditions, they talk about the same and the objective is basically the same. And we can find commonalities with everybody and we can find things which may inform our practice. In this particular case, I believe this mantra from Ramana Maharshi, it informs us about this cave in the heart, which is really relevant in Kundalini Yoga. And so that's why I bring it here. Anyway, back to the video. Enjoy. So I said that it, that it was a mantra that I, I liked, that I, it talks about this cave, and, and I love it because it's made by Ramana Maharshi, which uh, you can see him over there, and in my little, uh, little picture there in my altar. And that's, this is my personal guru. This is the, the one I feel closest to, even though I, I love the stories from all gurus, and I read all gurus' uh, teachings, uh, but um, this is my personal uh, connection to to the most divine, yeah, to the to the divine, and uh, he he's um, he was a saint who uh, was mostly in silence. He didn't speak too much. He was mostly in caves, living in caves, and um, in in Tiruvannamalai, you can you can go and visit the the mountain of Shiva, yeah, Arunachala, yeah, and uh, there is these caves there where he lived. And they have a very powerful energy. Just going into the cave is funny because when you enter into a cave, they are generally cool. I was talking about before, but these caves you enter in, you're really hot. This is why it's called the mountain of fire, yeah, and Shiva, because there's such a heat inside, and I believe it's like psychic heat, like spiritual heat. I remember being there with um, with some um, pilgrims, yeah. And, and one said, well, this is like spiritual surgery. You know, after being there for half an hour in silence, we came out and he said, that was like spiritual surgery. And I, I just didn't have words to express what I was feeling. But when he said that, it just felt right. It was, that's exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, he spent uh, most of his life in silence. But then as he was becoming more well-known, people from all over the world started to travel to visit him. 
and he would come down to the ashram that was created around him as well and sometimes go to the caves. And he noticed that <clears throat> for most uh, Indians, it's, it's enough to just be in his presence and just sit down and meditate. But these strange foreigners, <laughs> we Westerners, they just can't stop thinking. They are all thinking all the time. And they would sit in front of him and they were just like thinking and thinking and thinking. And he was just like, what, what the hell <laughs> What's happening here? <laughs> so <clears throat> I don't know, I'm making up a little bit of a story. Yeah. So he started to say things. Yeah. Uh, say a few words here, a few words there, answering some questions. And he's just giving a few tips for people to, to be able to actually stop all that thinking and go inwards and meditate. So he didn't say too much. He said very little, but the few things that he said, there's many books written about that. And um, they were, his words were very revealing. Yeah. Now there is a story, or at least that's the way I was told this story. I was uh, traveling in India and uh, I was in uh, one ashram in, by the foothills of Arunachala. And uh, I met this, uh, um, the person in charge of the ashram. And he, he chanted this um, mantra. Yeah, he chanted it for me. And he chanted it once and it had incredible impact. And he repeated it a few times. And then I would just, that was very dark at night just before going to sleep. And I was just, wow, what is this? What I found? What have I found? And I went to sleep and I remember because we had an open roof. And I remember spending the whole night with the eyes open, looking at the stars and just hearing the words in my head, like the whole mantra that we will chant in a moment. And that was like incredible. And the whole mantra stayed in myself, vibrating for almost two weeks because we did like a pilgrimage and then we came back. And when we came back two weeks later, I asked him, what was that thing you chanted? <laughs> what, you have to tell me the story of this mantra. What is it? And... Um, as far as I remember, the way I remember he said is that Ramana Maharshi was surrounded by many disciples and they were taking care of him, but they were also studying teachings and scriptures and they were practicing some forms of meditation, yoga and so on. And um, one of his uh, students, he was uh, trying to compose a poem. He was writing a poem <coughs> uh, in Sanskrit. Yeah. And he only wrote one, one sentence, the first sentence. Now, he wrote the first sentence. He couldn't make the second. He didn't know how to make the second. So he stopped the poem on the, on the, on the, on the ground and he went out. And uh, Ramana Maharshi looked at the piece of paper, looked at the first line, and then wrote down the whole poem, the rest of the poem, which is uh, interesting because I don't think there were many uh, situations in which Ramana Harshi was actually writing something down or actually giving some teachings and even less in Sanskrit because he was just a boy when he was enlightened, when he got um, absolute total liberation and he was only a boy when he had it. There's a beauty, beautiful story about this, but maybe some other time. And as he was a boy, he didn't have any studies really. And actually, some of the stories that were told about him is that he would fall asleep in, in this class, in the school, and he would sleep so deeply that nobody could wake him up. And actually, many children made fun of him because they, he, could, he wouldn't wake up and they would hit him and shake him and say all sorts of things to him. And he wouldn't wake up. And probably he was, he was so deep. Yeah. But anyway, just as a child, he got enlightened, so he had no education. But then he was writing this poem, which later, uh, this, the student, when he came back and he saw it, it was like perfect Sanskrit um, writing and rhythm and poetry. And it's such a perfect poem that it was, uh, it was very, very impressive. Yeah. So how about if we chant the poem? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write it down. And, and as I'm going to write down, because... I could write it just on the screen, but writing it down with your own pen has a special meaning for you, yeah? And, and, it, has, and it has some power, words have power. So I'm going to write it down here next to the drawing. And uh, as I'm writing it down, maybe we can see the, the meaning of the, of the words. And I was going to do it 
I'm going to do it in green because the green is one color that is very associated to the heart. Green and pink. <laughs> green and pink. So this is called... By the way, you can find it in the chapter 2 of the Ramana Gita. Uh, you can find it online. You can just do a search online. So... Ridaya Guhara Madhya Kevalam Brahma Matram So Ridaya Ridaya is the heart. Here we have and Guha. Guha is the cave. So this is the, the mantra about the cave of the heart. Very, very interesting. In the, in the cave of the heart lives Brahman. And he lives alone. I think Kevalam, I think is alone. And um and um by himself, yeah, in the center of this uh, heart lives himself. By himself and complete by himself, yeah. Ridaya Guharamadhyay Kevalam Brahma Matram And I believe this is the first line that the disciple wrote and then Ramana Maharshi wrote Aham Aham Iti Sakshat Atma Rupena Bhati I may not write everything perfectly, like I'm not sure this is a long A or a small Bhati Bhati. I'm not sure. But um I'm not sure which vowels are long and which are short in this case. But uh, you can find out. Aham Aham. I am, I am. Uh, this is, imagine, no? In the heart of the, in the, in the cave of the heart lives Brahman by himself and it's complete. And Brahman is, you can hear his vibration, aham, 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 aham. Yeah, it's like the sound of the heart beating. But when you listen, this heart in your cave of the heart, this heart is actually Brahman. Uh, the, and, uh, and it's uh, shining forth, yeah, shining bhati, like like in uh, Kapala Bhati, it's shining forth in the form of the soul, atma, rupanized form, yeah. So in the form of the soul, so the soul has this form there and is shining forth, aham aham, aham aham. This is most beautiful image, yeah. Hridi Vishamanasa Swam Hridi This is an R, yeah? Hridi Visha Saswam So, how to attain that? Hridi Vishamanasa Swam How to reach that? There is three ways, yeah? Chinvata Chinvata Majata Va. So by surrender and by self inquiry. Now, self inquiry is one of the teachings that he most popularized, the Ramana Maharshi, in the form of Who am I? Yeah, asking yourself, Who am I? Uh, whatever you are thinking, where is the source of that thought? Who is behind that thought? Go beyond yeah, the surface of the thoughts. And who is it that that essence of me that is observing these thoughts and that is existing? These are very profound teachings. We have a very inspiring modern teacher on 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 self inquiry, which is Muji. You probably have seen his videos. So I love the way he teaches this concept of self inquiry, and he's a he talks about Ramana Maharshi quite a bit as well. So. How to attain that? Surrender is one method, self-inquiry, and then bhavana, 
Shalana Rodat. I don't know if it's like this. I'm not sure. I'm probably writing some things wrong. Maybe it's not at the H, maybe it's just at the um Atma. Nishto Bhavatvam. So uh, Pavana is air, air, meaning the breath. Pavana Chalana Roda, that would be by the control of the breath and with mantra, yeah. Uh, recognizing how the breath and the mind are connected by controlling this breath, then um, you realize that. What do you realize? That Atma, your Atma, yeah, your Atma gets realized. So self-realization. So this is the the three paths to to find the self-realization. So. Um, how about we chant it together? I'm gonna I'm gonna chant it at the same time. I'm gonna put the text, and I invite you to chant along. Yeah. Rita ya guhar madhye ke valam brahma matra. Aham, aham, iti sakshat Atma rupa nabati Iti divi shamana saswam Chimvatam ajatabam Pavana chalana rodat Atmanishto Pavatvam Om Ridaya Guharamadye Kevalam Brahma Matram Aham Aham Miti Sakshat Atma Rupenabhati Iridi Vishamana Saswam Chimvata Majatava Pavana Chalana Rodat Admanishto Pavatvam Ridaya guhara madhye ke valam brahma matram aham aham miti sakshat adma rupena bati iridi vishamana saswam Chimvata Majataba Pavana Chalana Rodat Admanishto Babatvam Om Sadnam, I hope you could chant with me and had an experience of this most beautiful mantra for me. And um, these three caves are very much connected to our own awakening and the awakening of our Kundalini and the awakening of our inner light and the awakening of this aham aham, this feeling of I am going through them requires crossing the three knots. We will see this in another video. I will probably recommend it after this one. But for now, if you enjoyed this video and you <clears throat> would like more of this, I appreciate if you uh, like the, the video. It's important for the channel and subscribe it so you can always receive uh, more of these uh, videos. And just uh, Comment whatever about your experience. Comment anything that you felt, how you, how you experienced when we were chanting Guru, Guru, 
guru, guru, or the chanting of this mantra, or whatever question you have, if there is some particular topic that you would like me to explore in one of these videos, just write it in the comments and I will put it in my list of videos to do. And um, for now, thank you very much. Many blessings. Saddam. Uh-uh. <laughs>